Good afternoon uh, to all the heroes and heroines of today who managed to <laughs> stay until the last uh, session today. Um, now we are in an intimate group uh, <laughs> without the photographers and the, and the politicians, so we can uh, free. <laughs> yes. We, we can have a, um, um, a different discussion, I would just say, uh, which we might consider a, uh, the continuation of, of yesterday's last panel, which is an interesting that, uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, yesterday it was, it was more about prehistories or history, historical uh, precedents, uh, which uh, might provide explanatory frameworks for today's uh, conditions uh, uh, in uh, Europe and in Southeast Europe, in particular. But uh, this, uh, even and even yesterday in the in the final panel, if you if you recall. Uh, this kind of constant shift back and forth between public history, uh, collective memory, cultural memory, and all the different um, uh, forms that these can take, kind of, we kept shifting back and forth. And uh, this, this just um, uh, makes me think how unfinished the histories of, of, of uh, these regions are and how still um, there's no real um, consensus or consolidation of, of these histories, uh, which um, gives uh, even more reason for us to, to talk about uh, collective memories uh, of uh, uh, Central Eastern and uh, Southeast European um, uh, communities. And um, uh, this is what we'll, we will do uh, in the next about two hours. And I would like to welcome our panel and the panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Professor Monica Matei, who is an associate professor at the uh, Department of Economic and Social History at the University of Budapest, ELTE, but also she's, uh, she's an IASC fellow and she runs a uh, distinct uh, project uh, of talking houses at IASC, uh, which is an interesting um, uh, novel form of doing local history. Um, uh, Monica will talk about sort of a also a, a another uh, history uh, that doesn't have consensus over and it does it's, it's another unfinished history of uh, or chapter in Hungarian history of uh, socialism and now Monica the floor is yours. We are curious what you are going to say. Thank you very much, and it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, when we figured it out with Ivana what to uh, address, I actually suggested that I would contribute to this panel with uh, some of the experiences we collected when we worked on our project, Talking Houses. Um, I have 10 minutes, so I, I try not to be long. Uh, at all. Just a few points. I didn't make a PowerPoint because there is always just problem with technician, uh, techni technology and uh, I think a uh, few points can be uh, quite easily transmitted. So, first of all, um, I think in Eastern Europe or Central Europe uh, very often, and that's what I experience when talking to people as a historian, we believe that our memories are, are more brutal, uh, more horrible than uh, other memories or around the world. And I think we sh it's, it's, it's not necessarily true. Uh, all memories can be horrible, all memories can be heavy, it doesn't really matter where you are. Uh, or each group, you know, have the right to feel that, you know, the memories are just serious and important for them. Uh, when I teach classes, uh, I, I very much uh, enjoy recently that we at ELTA, we have students from basically all over the world, not only Western Europe, but South America, United States, Russia, uh, Ukraine, well, all over uh, Asian countries. And uh, 
sometimes I can see that uh, uh, students from either Asian countries or Western European countries sometimes have more serious conflicts than we have here in Central Europe. So it's not true that um, you know we don't have the privilege uh, having the most brutal memories. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, talking houses. Uh, it's a project where we try to collect stories from different, uh, until this point, Hungarian cities, but uh, we have, of course, uh, the wish to, um, to go ahead with this project. And, uh, of course, I will not go into the details. The important thing for us is um, to uh, offer alternatives to the national narrative, national history, uh, and uh, that's why we introduced uh, this term, um, um, which actually is um, uh, was also used by art historians, uh, uh, a Polish art historian Piotr Piotrowski, who, uh, who first used the term uh, horizontal art history, and that's what we actually borrowed, horizontal history, which is not a little more than local, because local history is just focuses on uh, the local stories, the local events. What we try to do is just uh, combining microhistory, microhistory methods, and just attach them with uh, more global aspects or, or more uh, general aspects. Okay, when we talk about memories uh, and local memories, um, um, I, I also would like to introduce another term. We make many interviews, oral history interviews, and uh, next to uh, local houses, we can use the term talk, talk, talking houses, talking heads, which means that we really ask people and want to, and we are very much curious about you know, what kind of memories they have about the past. We have uh, connections with different families who actually live in those cities about which we uh, made books. Kusek, for example, but also West Brim and some other Hungarian cities. And uh, these interviews are uh, very interesting because we learned a lot from them. And I just would like to focus now on one particular uh, case when uh, uh, when we had to understand that how the trauma of uh, the, the Soviet system after uh, more than 30 years after the fall of the regime is still not worked out in a uh, community. And this is the trauma of uh, uh, West Brim, West Brim people who actually had a communist uh, leader uh, for more than 20 years. Uh, uh, his name was Janos Pop. And his case was very unique because he uh, basically, uh, the uh, working on the memory of this or working on this trauma, what he caused to this city, already began during the socialist time. So he was basically the first communist leader who was moved away from his position already in the mid middle of the 1980s. And um, a very unique event uh, in Hungary uh, took place in basically the same day when Viktor Orban uh, gave his famous speech at the Hero Square in June 1989, when uh, he actually uh, uh, or they organized a memorial to the heroes of the 1956 revolution. Uh, basically the same day, the first conference to talk about the sins of this uh, communist leader was organized in West Brim. And uh, in our national story or national history, uh, the speech of uh, Viktor Orban, everybody knows about it, and of course it's very much in the history books by now. But the fact that these local people actually were brave enough, and, and of course we talk about, uh, you know, Viktor Orban's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how brave he was that he, and that, that there was the danger that the Russians would, sh would kill him or, you know, uh, interrupt, uh, intervene in this, um, in this event uh, that's part of the national myth, uh, the fact that the first conference talking or discussing 
uh, the, uh, the sins of uh, a communist leader was almost organized the same day, uh, one day later. And uh, uh, it's, I think uh, the case of this uh, Janos Pop is very interesting for many reasons. First of all, because this trauma is absolutely not solved uh, in, the, uh, in the city. Uh, when last year, just one year ago, um, with a colleague of mine, uh, we started to work on it and started to write about, make a research and write about it. Uh, West Prime people uh, paid much attention and they very much, uh, you know, tried to convince us that yes, you should do it, it's very important for us. Um, and the third thing is that uh, we, what we learned from this case that there is not, there is not one version and not one memory. There are many memories. Uh, okay, very briefly, uh, the, the, the most important, uh, this uh, Janos Pop was a, a very uh, contradictory personality and, and politician, but the most, his most important um, uh, sin is that uh, there was, a, during the 56th revolution, there was a head of the revolutionary committee in, the, in West Brim, who was a secondary school teacher, a very intelligent person. And uh, after the fall of the revolution, he was, uh, of course, uh, imprisoned. And he received a sentence, not the death penalty, but just years in prison. And this Janos Pop actually turned to the court and asked for a... Um, a, a verse sentence, uh, he basically said and, and suggested that this is not enough. And uh, he proposed a death sentence and then this man was executed. So this trauma is still not worked out and there are still very contradictory memories about the figure of this Janos Pop. Most importantly because he was the only communist leader who committed suicide. So after the transition he was struggling with his uh, past and not only suicide, but actually I just talked, because I'm working on the case, and I just talked to a psychologist, and, and I asked him, okay, and what is worse than a suicide? And then his immediate answer was a double suicide. This Janos Pop killed his wife, and then he killed himself. It's 1994, and uh, Vesprim, where uh, Imre uh, Navracic, Tibor, sorry, Tibor Navracic comes from, that's his native city, who was just sitting here half an hour ago, uh, is still, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that there are still com competing versions of what actually happened, so the memory is not settled at all, and I think this is very important for us to understand. Of course, if you have questions, we can uh, talk about it more, why the figure of Janos Pop is not settled. It's not like, a, um, you know, a, a shared and um, you know interpretation for all the people, but there are competing versions. Um, so I think we have to really understand that memory is something which we cannot control. Of course, uh, a totalitarian regime can control the past, and once it's over, then we can feel that okay, we are free people, and and we can say we can have our own memories. But it's not so easy as we know, and I think that uh, it's uh, your the region you will talk about can teach us uh, new lessons about that as well. Thank you. Yes, and this was the the party uh, secretary who wanted to turn the balaton to a, a, a field of corns. And also, among others, he, uh, and, the, and the other thing is he started this hu huge city center project in Vesprim, as a result of which now uh, we do not have the old historic center. We have um, sort of what there is now, uh, a bunch of concrete buildings. And it's very difficult uh, to to cultivate uh, the memory of the old Jewish quarter and the synagogue and uh, and all the 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 streets that used to be around it, so it was a total replanning of of the city center of West Bram. So he was he was truly infamous in this sense. And um, uh, now we have. Um, 
a different topic because uh, what I find and what uh, what is um, very um, pattern like in memory sessions is that we kind of get a uh, kind of smaller case studies of certain issues of certain events certain contexts and then perhaps it is our job to somehow aggregate them or somehow derive at a more uh, abstract um, interpretative uh, position where we can sort of draw conclusions on based on but those can only always just be partial. So that's that's a very very interesting um, feature of 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 the topic itself. And memory scholars often complain that there is there is just no possibility to to um, analyze to 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 come up with an interpret a proper interpretative framework for because memory is everything. So uh, now uh, let's uh, have. Um, Dr. Zala Pavcic, um, and she uh, is a postdoctoral post -doctoral fellow at uh, the Democracy Institute at the CEU. And uh, she is a historian, uh, but she does uh, kind of um, an ethnography of, of um, former Yugoslav uh, 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 territories. And um, she will talk to us about friendships which is a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, uh, I was a part of a workshop that she organized in the, in the fall around friendship uh, uh, in different times, periods, and different uh, 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 geographical contexts. So, and that was a very, very interesting workshop. And uh, now, Zala, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first, the disclaimer, I think I'm not aiming for 15, but for 16, <laughs> if, that's <laughs> if that's possible, but I will do my best to keep with the, to keep with the timing. So, uh, why friendship? I think that friendship matters because when we look at war statistics, usually we talk about data like the number of deceased, the number of displaced, number of sexually assaulted, and so on, and this um, list rarely contains um, the loss of social structure or people encounter as a consequence of war, but however, mid-war narratives of friendship reflect not only the personal struggles that people encounter with the beginning of the war when they have mostly lost friends due to death, migration, loss of contact, political disagreements, and so on. Um, in the media settings, these narratives can also serve propaganda purposes and convey the desired for forms of sociability corresponding to the newly established na national politics. And this, in a way, also relates to Monica's comments. So not just there is no not one memory, also there is not one interpretation. Um, in her book, Affective Communities, Emma Hutchinson explores how seemingly individu individual traumatic uh, encounters can acquire larger uh, and societal political importance as well as the mechanisms behind the victim's pain which then becomes the pain of the, the, the pain of the nation and by doing so she emphasizes that emotions are inevitably shaped by dominant political discourses and following her conceptualization my claim is that in much as the same ways as we have deaths on the front and the grievances of women and the war apes and so on friendship too can become a flat a platform for mobilizing um, emotions and what is more when friendship enters the public spirit often enough turns itself into a trope this means that its depiction is not meant to solely describe uh, a person's disappointing personal experience but it's supposed to embody a dialogue between representatives of two juxtaposed communities which is tailored towards historical and societal conventions. And these conventions um, also presuppose that this kind of dialogue is played out by two, ma two men, never between a married couple or two female friends, or even less likely between a female and a male friend. Uh, one of the most characteristic examples of this narrative is the song Hey My Belgrade Friend performed by the Croatian musician Jura Stublic and the music group uh, Film. 
and uh, this song and uh, the accompanying video awaited its um, premiere on Croatian national television on the 14th of February 1992, means on the eve of the international recognition of Croatia's independence. And the release of this very well-known song was commemorated in January 2022 in the Croatian War Veterans web portal on this day. And the portal describes the song as one of the most notable symbols of the homeland war and the contribution of Croatian artists to raising the morale of the Croatian defense forces in the defense of the homeland war against the Serb Chetnik aggressors. Male friendship, as said, has a long history of serving as a language of expressing political messages as well as solving institutional issues. And in order to resemble the multi-ethnic setting of now former Yugoslavia, what we see is a friendship pair which should also be ethnically mixed and therefore serve as a metaphor. And the interaction in the song follows some common grounds of prescribed notions of men, homosocial behavior, which um, includes also boasting about sexual con conquest on one hand and intense competition on the other. And in this kind of narrative, women are denied um, their independent role. And we could also say that the introductionary mention of Serbian girls only serves uh, to establish a rivalry between two former friends, where it is also significant to, to note that the soldier will kill his friend with whom he once shared women in songs. And one could argue that the song portrays uh, the relationship between the former friends as something problematic, even impossible due to their inability to define one's identity outside the parameters set by the ideology of the nation. And thus, it could be said that the war setting implied that people should take sides and abandon their multi-ethnic relations, especially those with Serbian citizens as representatives of the aggressor state. In 2018, Jura Stublic would claim that he does not perform the song Hey, Bel My Belgrade Friend on stage anymore, as people mistakenly interpreted the song as describing his friendships. He would argue that his friends, on the contrary, spent the wartime period as peace demonstrators in Belgrade. And while the song reached the peaks of music charts in Croatia, it has also indeed found its listeners among Belgrade anti-war circles natural, naturally to great disapproval of official editorial policy, which forbade trans transmitting Croatian and Slovene songs as they were now um, cultural production of the enemies. Thus, when Anita Lazin Nonveje, then music editor of Radio Serbia's first program, kept airing the song in February 1992, her move was followed by her suspension and her lawsuit against such a decision was rejected. And while she and her family were exposed to increasing threats and harassment, she firstly moved to France, where she gained political asylum and eventually to Canada. In an interview for the Journal, journal Danas from 2019, Nonveje Lazin recalls that it was a very challenging period. Uh, she, stay, she started losing her friends and colleagues ceased to communicate with her. And her superiors have organized a discipline committee and urged her colleagues to testify that she was a Croatian agent and is against the Serbian nation. One night, one of her colleagues appeared on her doorstep admitting that she was summoned to testify against her and that she will, in fact, testify against her, although she does share her views. However, her colleague concluded, I am also a single mother, which Nonveje described as an exemplary case from that period. Uh, well, it is possible indeed to understand the song Hey My Belgrade Friend as a pacifistic reminder of Yugoslav realities in which yesterday's friends and neighbors became war enemies. The video clip accompanying um, the song is hardly ever brought into discussion and yet I believe provides grounds for a more militaristic understanding. Because throughout the video, what we can see is Yura to be dressed in an army uniform, parting on a military tank which carries a Croatian flag. And as the song reaches the description of his blonde Serbian lover, uh, the video shows a long-haired fair photo model wearing a uniform and holding a machine gun in her hands. Um, and the ensuing instrumental sequence is a literal depiction of the male gaze, so the female character in uniform crouching on the river bank, showing off her lux luxuriant hair and throwing an object into the river, facing the camera with her behind, while the sol soldier is watching her with her binoculars. 
while we barely ever see the male soldier's face, the female's physical attributes remain in the forefront and compel the observers to praise her for her beauty rather than for her military abilities, which make her army-like appearance feel like a parody, and thus, putting the final sequence aside, it could hardly be said that the video clip is a representation of friendship, which um, a, a presentation, which a, a depiction of an equal communication, which, which friendship is supposed to represent. Rather, it could be said that it's a version of the battle of the sexes. Um, furthermore, the song swiftly gained its response by the Serbian rock musician Bora Djordjevic and the group Minjushari. With their song Hey My Zag Zagreb Friend, and this piece, ex as you can see, exceeds the original, both in chauvinism and its violent and threatening rhetoric towards the addressee. And the singer discussed the circumstances behind this song in 2012. In, in this interview, Bora Djordjevic claimed that he has written the song as a banter and that he has not, in fact, broken any of his friendships that he has held since pre-war period in Croatia. And even more so when the Croatian journalist confronts him about the threatening lyrics of his parody, implying that he might want to apologize to his neighboring state, to which um, Djordjevic claims that he does not understand the original song as an anti-war piece either. The end of the song, he says, that he will shoot and then cry bitterly. There's no need for him to cry. Uh, the media plays a crucial role in the mobilization of the masses by portraying a picture where people are neatly divided into victims and um, oppressors. And as Dubrovka Zharkov said, uh, uh, Yugoslav media space has been resembling a state of war from the 80s onwards. Uh, which means that it's been intensely engaged in paving the way of, in, of national politics and nationalist discourse, and at the same time attacking the general population and politics of other republics and nations. Um, moreover, she would claim that the purpose of such hostile communication represented in the media war was the creation of ethnicity with notions of femininity and masculinity as its es essential ingredients, and as well as the recreation of public and private emotions, this also affects uh, to the creation of the notions of the enemies, of the traitors of the state, and so forth. And apart from Serbs as the representatives of the aggressor state, public disdain in such circumstances is oriented towards, especially towards people who would publicly express anti-war statements, criticism towards their own nation and people who would pub publicly plea for peace or for multi-ethnic cohabitation. Even more so as um, prominent Yugoslav gender scholars such as Ra Radaj Vekovic who would uh, notice, she would claim that the symbolic setting of a fratricidal war doesn't include only the outside other being the representative of the other community, but also the inside other representing women of the same nationality. And one of the probably uh, best known examples of this process, apart from Anita Laz in non of course, is the case of the prominent Croatian act actress um, Mira Furlan, who has spent years preceding the war living and working between Belgrade and Zagreb together with her Serbian husband. And in September 1992, after the war in Croatia has already began, she decided to um, take a performance at the festival BTEF in Belgrade, even though all other Croatian theaters decided to boycott it as Belgrade wasn't the capital of the common state anymore. Um, so the festival bulletin published her statement in which she claims that she decided to take part in uh, the performance because this was her only hope not to lose faith and the possibility of us work, all working all together and because this is the way she is saving herself from um, utter despair. And the media smear against, uh, against Mira Furlan started with a female journalist claiming that she was parading her naked breasts on a Belgrade stage while people were in fact dying in Croatia, while in Belgrade she was also accused of being a Croatian spy and as a non-Serb continuously insulted and mistreated, and to escape her pressure, she moved to New York with her husband. Uh, when she could no longer um, bear the, dis the disappointment over her denigration, she published an open letter from where you, uh, the excerpts you can see on the screen. So uh, a letter to my co-citizens pub published in the newspaper Danas. 
and in it she would express her feelings of uh, isolation deriving from the treatment she was undergoing after the publication of her festival statement. So while friendship has the power to transgress boundaries and to connect, it also has the potential to exclude. And while we can follow the reaction of the community to Furlan's letter writing in the form of their uh, response letters published by the same journal. We can also trace the echo of the said letter in anti-war circles and in books uh, such as, for example, Balkan Express by Slavenka Drakulic, where she accompanies excerpts, e excerpts from her letter with the words, I carry her letter around as my own burden, as a way of explaining to others what is happening to us and to our friendships during the war. Um, and this brings me to the I promise, very last point that I wanted to make with my presentation, and while I have started this talk by pointing out that friendship is instrumental in constructing, as well as deconstructing uh, the desired self and sociability in our societies, it is also pivotal for movements which try to defile the prevailing policies, and in this case, nationalism, and this could be displayed with the help of the framework conceived by Lila Gandhi in her book Affective Communities, where she explores friendships of antagonist movements as the kind of bond and statement which challenges the demands of the state and is best encapsulated in the essay Two Cheers for Democracy by Edward Forster, where he asks himself, so love and loyalty to an individual can run counter to the claims of the state. And when they do down with the state's AI, which means that the state would down me. And interestingly enough, in, the, in her letter to my co-citizens, Mira Furlan asked herself an almost identical question. That is, how many friends do you have to betray to keep from committing the only socially acknowledged betrayal? And that is the betrayal of the nation. Um, I have begun this talk with the question of war statistics, victims, and casualties and what should in my mind also be taken into consideration is the questions uh, is the question of how many people's lives are destroyed for choosing not to comply or on the other hand choosing to comply and then having to live with the difficult choices and the compromises they were forced to do in such circumstances and turning our scholarly and personal especially personal attention to friendship would include not only the question of public representation, its value and self-representation marker, and its emotional value, but also tackling with the question of wider mechanisms of restrictions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zala. Um, okay, next uh, we have um, Dr. Petra Hammer. And uh, she is an ethnologist and cultural anthropologist. And she's, um, her work is on popular music and uh, culture in South Southeastern Europe uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries. And um, she, she wrote a, her PhD about uh, popular music in Bosnian and Herzegovina and army artistic units. Um, focusing on the question of national identity, construction of multi-ethnic society. Uh, today, she will talk about the nationalism uh, in um, Bosnia and uh, uh, Croatia. Is that is that right? Is that right? Just in Bosnia, okay, and uh, and the forms that it takes, and um, I I'm guessing that Petra is going to connect it to memory. Petra, the floor is yours. Thank you for this presentation. I mean, thank you for this introduction. Uh, yeah, I'll be talking, yeah, not just about lost friendships, former neighbors, and sadly not about music but uh, about uh, nationalisms in public discourses, referring to one case study, the mass grave in the city of Priador in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so in uh, August 2013, uh, Bosnian authorities discovered one of the largest mass grave sites uh, in a small village called Tomashica, around 20 kilometers from Priador, which is in northwest Bosnia, now part of the Republika Srpska. 
uh, they found remains of 400, uh, 435 people and could identify 247 of them. And just to let you know, the remains were mostly from the war victims who were killed in various places around Priedor, around in the period from 1992 to 1995. Officially, uh, 3,176 civilians were killed. Uh, and sadly, not all have been found till today. So when conducting uh, fieldwork research for the ARC project, the agency where I am currently working on, I researched the role of the dead in lives of individuals in contemporary societies. And I spent uh, three months in Priedor talking to people about war, about mass graves, about the role of the dead in their lives. And when conducting uh, semi-structured interviews with people of different national and religious affiliations, it turned out that there are actually two completely different war narrative existing, coexisting side by side. One that is explained and told to me by the Bosniaks or Bosnian Muslims, and the one that the Bosnian Serbs are telling me. Uh, are telling me. So I would like to show in this presentation uh, how political actors employ mass grave victims in order to spread nationalistic ideas and um, how does this discourse uh, affect people in Predor area in their everyday life. But I'm sure that not all of you are familiar with the situation, what actually happened in Predor. Let me just give you a brief uh, historical context about uh, it started in spring 1992 when the Bosnian uh, Serb authorities overtook the control in the municipality of Priedor and they actually started the ethnic cleansing campaign of Bosnian Muslims or after 1993, we know the word Bosniak, and Bosnian Croats living in that area. Uh, and um, soon uh, around 30,000 people of non-Serb or origin were uh, locked in uh, several uh, concentration camps uh, and many of them actually never came out. So according to the Sarajevo-based uh, research and documentation center, 4,868 people were killed or went missing. Uh, to give you some, some um, information or some stories of my interviewees, uh, what actually, how they experienced the whole situation, I will quote, I was fired from my job in Priedor. So were my neighbors. At first, I did not know that this might be because I am a Muslim. When the Bosnian Serbs army attacked my village, I was hiding in the forest nearby. I saw my old neighbor being shot at his doorstep. After being captured, uh, I was brought to Omarska prison camp where I was tortured every day. Living conditions were zero. Many people were killed or disappeared. What hurts the most, guards were some of my classmates, even my co-workers, and they were beating me and humiliating me every single day. After that, I came back to my village in 2001, rebuilt my house, and I see myself and my fellow Bosniak returnees as the guardians of Bosnia-Herzegovina in Republika Srpska. It sounds bizarre, but it is true. Another interviewee, for example, said, so many innocent lives were lost, so many families destroyed. For what? I have more dead family members on cemeteries than alive in their houses. And now I am not allowed to commemorate my victims or say that what happened in Priedor is genocide only because the ICTY did not rule it. So after Dayton, a uh, peace agreement was signed in December 1995. The war officially ended and it took a couple of years, many international organizations, that people finally had a chance to start uh, returning to their destroyed homes. For example, uh, when I came, one interviewee said, when I came back to my village with my family, uh, there was nothing there. Everything was destroyed. You can see some pictures on the slide. This is, for example, a city of Kozarac. Uh, everything was gone because of politics and stupid nationalistic ideas. So after the war, Priedor uh, became more and more Serbian, where villages around it are now inhabited by either Bosniaks or, Bo or Bosnian Serbs, or they are empty. Mixed villages don't exist anymore. As interviewees claimed, the coexistence and tolerance between ethnic groups is gone because of political, political nationalistic rhetorics. 
the trust is gone until today the official municipal memory politics not just deny the existence uh, or the, the torture and the death of thousands of people, but it also remained exclusively reserved for the victims of Serb ethnic background. Fieldwork results have shown that when talking to Bosnian Serbs, the genocide denial is often present. Uh, conspiracy of silence is very much present. Uh, this is very much visible through the memorial culture or monuments existence in the, or their absence and also through nationalistic rhetorics and uh, in public and private sphere. So I think that uh, I'm, I was talking about uh, Bosniak nationalism, Serbian nationalism. What exactly do I mean by that? Basically, uh, I would say that both is a, a ter territorial claim or claim over a territory uh, where one is more visible than, uh, than the other. And I would just like to give you two examples uh, of it. Uh, to start with the um, with the Serbian Serbian Bosnian Serb nationalism, I think that it is imp important to stress that there was one event, very recent event, that influenced the um, rising of this uh, Bosnian Serb nationalism, and this is the UN resolution uh, of Srebrenica genocide, uh, where uh, in May this year. Uh, the UN actually um, said that uh, the resolution was adopted condemning any denial of the Srebrenica genocide as a historical event and action that glorified this event uh, or these convicted war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide by international courts. Uh, so uh, since this year, uh, 11th of July is an international day of reflection and commemoration of the 1995 genocide in Srebrenica. And here you can see that sadly Hungary was one of the countries uh, that voted against, uh, next to Belarus, China, Russia, and of course Serbia. Uh, so in general, this resolution contributed to a stunning rise of uh, especially Bosnian Serb and Serbian nationalism. And I think that the greatest, the most obvious example of it was a campaign, Menismo Genocida Narod, meaning we are not a genocidal nation, uh, where there were, um, there were rallies, there were demonstrations. And what I think it's important to stress in this context is that genocide was um, proved to happen in Srebrenica, but it did was not proved that it happened in Priador. So I think that in Srebrenica, people got if I can say it that way, a closure, while in Priedor this was not the case. All the destroyed houses, all the people who were killed, who are still missing, whose bones were never found, uh, their family members never got a closure. Uh, and next to, next to this campaign, Menismo Genocida Narod, was also a rally, Serbska Vazuzove, Republika Serbska is calling you, that was organized in Banja Luka in April, uh, uh, 2024 under a motto uh, no one can and no one will humiliate us so where the uh, the president of Republika Srpska Milo Radodik was actually claiming again that he will uh, the Republika Srpska will dissolute from uh, from uh, uh, Bosnia so to give you example of Bosniak nationalism I honestly had to think if where does it exist and what I noticed is that it's definitely where more sub subtle, more less visible than, for example, the nationalism of Bosniak Serbs, and it's more visible in um, in everyday life rhetorics, uh, in in commemorations that are happening every day. It's more visible in in the local at the local cemeteries where you will see the flag of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the uh, flag of Islamic community, but not the flag of Republika Srpska. Uh, and you will see it in the villages where now the mostly Bosniak people are living. Uh, and uh, it's a clear territorial claim, but it also ends with the borders of the village. Uh, even commemorating the places of crimes is minimized to the community or the village where the crime happened and you will never see or rarely see politicians and religious officials to attend commemorations from the other side. Uh, to conclude, 
Bosnian Serb interviewees individually and collectively denied the existence of mass graves. Uh, they actively minimized the number of non-Serbs victims and praised killed and wounded soldiers of their own nation. They see the war as the defense act against, against Muslim and Croatian extremist group who wanted to destroy the existence of Republika Srpska. Prison camps were gathering centers and they were always referring to the victims of Ustasha regime from the Second World War. On the other side, uh, Bosnian interviewees all have a similar story. They were imprisoned, their family members killed, houses destroyed, properties confiscated, and they were all expelled. So when many returned to, uh, to Priedor, uh, they came back and started renovating their houses. Many of them are now disappointed and they regret the return while others fight uh, for, their for, uh, for their future and the people are trying to open new, uh, new businesses and continue with their lives. What is interesting uh, is they all claim they want to live in peace and prosperity because there is no other way and this rhetoric is then on both individual and political level. But sometimes I still have the feeling when walking the streets of Priedor that one nation and one ethnic group is more present and more welcome than the other. By the end of the day, the reality is that both Bosniak Serbs and Bosniaks emigrated to different countries because of bad political, economic, social situation in the area, leaving ethno-national disputes and nationalistic uh, rhetoric behind because all what they want 29 years after the war ended, finally live a normal life, as they said. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Petra. Um, uh, okay, I let me not say anything. Uh, this is way too difficult to to talk uh, after such uh, accounts. So I would just like to now uh, call to the microphone Rubin, uh, whom you all know by now, and Rubin has chosen to to talk more about as far as, if, if I'm correct, the collective memories of Yugoslavia as, as a unit. So, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bela. And also thank you to the previous panel, it was really interesting. Um, actually, I, my presentation will be not so academic and scholarly. I much made this presentation to be with uh, photos and videos because I'm as ethnographer, anthropologist is always saying that one photo is speaking more than 1,000 words. So probably you will see and you will follow what's going on in these 30 years, actually, in the Yugosfera. Yugosfera, yesterday, those who was in this session heard about what it means Yugosfera. It means that actually, even that Yugoslavia does not exist, we still have Yugoslav heritage, which is in the history, in the values, in the music <laughs> in artists and so on and we mentioned actually yesterday what is happened when george balashevic and, and oliver dragovic died actually all yugoslavia was trowering uh, and not only this uh, famous musician but also when mira furlan died mm -hmm. also it was very trowering bataji vujinovic will see later one of the heroes of the <laughs> of the yugoslav movies and so on but also, um, uh, what, what uh, give me, please, the slide. Yeah. Uh, what is interesting, we will see also what's going on after that um, Yugoslavia collapsed and how uh, new identities and uh, new memories are constructing a building because it's actually it's a, it's a life process. Uh, as uh, already mentioned here, the collective memories are memories shared by the group that influence their social identity. Uh, studies tend to focus eight, uh, on the choice of the past or how the memory against mobilize the past or the weight of the past or uh, how the past affect the individual of the group. Uh, then this social mental topography implies a pronouncedly cognitive focus and looks at how the past is registered and organized in our minds. Therefore, the researcher is primarily interested not in what actually happened, in a history, it's, uh, of course it's the job of the historians, but we as anthropologists uh, are much more interested in how that event is remembered in a, in a society or maybe later in the in future. 
Many past experiences are truly forgotten and not everything that occurs in recorded in our mind. This photo is actually me <laughs> in uh, Zaporozhia in Ukraine. It was uh, 2015, I think. And um, for example, even the Ukrainians, they didn't want it to, thr to throw the Lenin. This is the monument of Lenin, actually in Zaporozhia, because uh, they, they had some positive, let's say, impression about Lenin and so on. But they wanted to actually to, to show that Lenin is also Ukrainian, one kind of um, agent of the, of, the, of the collective memory and collective path. For that reason, they were the monument of Lenin with Ukrainian folk um, folk dress, actually, just to see that he is, even that he was not, a, I, I think he was Uzbek, huh? Lenin was, his, I don't know. Never mind, uh, um, he, he was very close to Ukraine. And unfortunately, these monuments later, two years later, was moved and today it's not existing anymore. This is Kruja in Albania. <laughs> uh, it's also a very important uh, uh, object for Albanian history. It's not now, it was built during the, the communist time. So anthropology is especially aware of the social context in which we access the past, serving as a helpful reminder that we generally only recall a large portion of our action as member of a specific group. And the process of adopting a social identity includes learning about group memories and identifying with its collective past a key component of community efforts to assimilate new members in equitating them in this past. Okay, now I will not read anymore. We we'll just see the, the pictures. Uh, now, when we're talking about um, Yugoslavia, what has happened in these last 30, 35 years, uh, uh, I divided actually on, uh, on some chapters. The first chapter was uh, neglecting of the Tito and Tito's heritage and achievement and neglecting of the national liberal uh, army of the, of the war that was happened during the Second World War. One of the greatest achievements actually of, of Tito and the communists, uh, and for that reason actually Yesterday we discussed why the Yugoslav socialism was so liberal and so on, because actually the Yugoslav uh, communists, they make their, how to say, liberation uh, army and they liberate it uh, by himself, not by so much big help of the Soviet Union, uh, except the, the other European countries, when actually when the Red Army acted in, in, uh, in uh, other countries, they, they were liberated from fascism, but uh, we will see later in uh, Yugoslavia the resistance was existing even from the, the 4th of July 1941, we will see later also. Um, so uh, actually during Yugoslavia each republic had by one city that held the name Tito. <laughs> it was Tito of Velenia in Slovenia, Tito of Koprivnica in Croatia. Uh, how was there in Bosnia? I can see it. Uh, Igor? Tito Vrbas, yes, the famous Vrbas. <laughs> Tito Vrbas in Vojvodina, uh, Tito Grad, today is Podgorica, Tito Grad, the main city, the capital of Montenegro, held the name of the Tito. Tito Vojvodica, the first republic actually, where Tito was, uh, Tito Mitrovica in Kosovo, and Tito Veles in Macedonia. So it was, a, 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 how to say, a big prestige to hold the Tito's mm -hmm. name, <laughs> actually, in Yugoslavia, but immediately after Yugoslavia was collected, all these cities, moved the name of Tito, and they are just only Veles, Užice, Verbas, Podgorica, they totally changed the name, actually, of Titograd, uh, and so on. And uh, we, we, uh, we have some, actually, we'll see later, it's a, f it's a full list, actually, of how many public uh, places, like Piazza, Turk, uh, Square, um, streets, and so on, were, were removed, but they are still keeping. For example, this is still, if you go into to Kopar, it's a city in Slovenia near to, to the border with Italy, with Trieste. The piazza there is called Tito, Tito of Turk, Tito of Piazza. We also have other cities, you'll we'll see. For example, this is uh, Sarajevo. In Sarajevo still we have the main street is uh, uh, the street of uh, Marshal Tito. This is downstairs Kumanovo, the, the, the main square actually in Kumanovo is still Plošta Tito and so on. And um, all these tables, I see. I, I, probably this was somewhere where the, the um, uh, Hungarian minority live. Somewhere in Vodina, you see Tito Marshal Utsa. Utsa, how is it in Hungarian? <laughs> yeah. 
so uh, actually so many cities uh, had this uh, but when it, it came uh, the process of the changing of the of the these public places was not so easy actually this is zagreb downstairs uh, the plostat was marshal tito and uh, when the the, the tujman parties had as they come to the to the power uh, the, the the council of, of zagreb actually had uh, two or three years discussion about to, to remove or not to remove the the, the name of Marshal Tito of the, of the main uh, square, Turk Marshal Tita. Uh, but uh, I think 2060 they succeed actually to, to throw <laughs> the, the, the name of Tito, even that uh, still it's a now new initiative to return him back and so on. And I think that Croatia have to keep it. Uh, it's my opinion, I don't know, maybe you're wrong, but Croatia has to keep it, uh, uh, the name of the Tito. Even, but what is also uh, very contradiction, uh, those who know very well the history of Yugoslavia. For example, we go now to Zagreb, there is no anymore Tito streets, but we have, you find there of Hanria Hebrand. Hanria Hebrand was also the communist leader, one of the first, uh, let's say, Stalinist in, uh, <laughs> during the, 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 the communist time, and he was the first actually Croatian communist who was arrested by Tito. And we have in a main, uh, one of the main streets is Hanria Hebrand Street in Zagreb. And for me, it's a contradiction. This is my city, Ohrid, where is the, the, the Ohrid Lake there. Uh, 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 and the, the, the main square and the main uh, um, road during the course of the Ohrid Lake is, it was Marshal Tito. They made the uh, initiative to change it. Then all these uh, uh, veterans uh, grow, uh, grow up not to change the name of Tito. And now we have in Ohrid, for example, one ridiculous, actually we have official uh, decision that, that now that uh, uh, Riviera, how you Ria, we called uh, Ria Macedonia, but uh, we still have in our new official documents ID, is still staying uh, K, K Marshal Tito. I, I just uh, <laughs> took one of my ID a few months ago, it still stay Marshal Tito. So, uh, it's, it's not easy process actually to change. Uh, and now what we have, uh, even that um, we have this process, uh, however, remembering of the, of the Tito is still a, a big cult. These two photos on from, the, from the left side actually are in Kumrovets. Uh, every 24th of May is the day when Tito is born actually. In Kumrovets are uh, collecting people from all Yugoslavia, <laughs> ex-Yugoslavia, they are celebrating actually. You can also find a lot of uh, videos how they are celebrating there. Kumrovets is here from two hours, I think, from, from Kuzek, so maybe next summer summer school we can organize <laughs> one, one day to go to there and to see. Uh, actually, it's an ethno village, we call it. Yeah, it's, a, it's a big complex of... Uh, of this Kumrovets, but it's a still a holy place, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, is the house of, of flowers in Belgrade. These four photos were actually is the grave of Tito, and every 4th of May people are going there from all over the ex-Yugoslavia, not only from Yugoslavia. I saw one video actually, because Tito was the leader of the non alias movement, I, I think uh, who Ivana spoke about yesterday, People from I don't know from Libya, from Iraq, from everywhere are coming actually to to to, to give uh, uh, the honor to to Tito, and it's really we're still keeping actually this um, memory to to Tito's. And now uh, we are going to this uh, other let's say holy places <laughs> of of of, Yugoslav, of Yugoslavia. This is the uh, the place Tjentište today is in Republika Srpska actually in Bosnia. Uh, where was the fifth, uh, we call it fifth offensive of, uh, of Germans and fascists against uh, uh, the, 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 the partisans and, and, uh, and Tito. And actually, you see the first picture, it's original picture, uh, when this guy from the British mission actually who was there, who, who took a, a picture of Tito when he was wandering. He was the only, let's say also, uh, leader of the army during the Second World War who was wandering. One when was bombing, and for that also battle was m in 1974-5. I don't know was shooting the movie Sutjeska, and the main role of Tito was uh, acting by Richard Barton there. And uh, you can also find this movie in a 
on a YouTube. It's very interesting. But today also, uh, uh, last year was 80 anniversary of 80 years of the Sutjes or the or of, uh, offensive, and the people from all over again <laughs> Yugoslavia came there and uh, celebrated. This, I think that, uh, okay, this is another, this is place very close to, where, um, to Mostar where Igor is living. It's, um, it's the fourth offensive. Actually from this, it, it was made one kind of myth and cult about Tito that he's, he was very smart and clever uh, leader because he, he succeeded to, to make a trick something and, uh, and um, to, to escape from the termination of partisans by um, uh, this, 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 this bridge there, Jablanica, on the Neretva uh, river. Uh, he destroyed the, the, the bridge, and for that reason, the German thought that he will not cross the river, but immediately after that, he made one Pontian bridge uh, improvisation, and then again, they, they went to the other side of the river. But what is more important, there were only, let's say, 500 partisan soldiers and more than 5,000 wandering people. So this battle is also known as a battle for the wandering people. How to say it? Wandering. Wonder. 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 Wonder people, yeah. Wonder. Wonder. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and today also, always when it's uh, in February, this offensive was actually in February, people are coming. Last year was uh, again the 80 anniversary of the 80 years of... Uh, of, um, oh, sorry. Yes, can you, uh, I will now show just a little bit video about uh, this Tientiste, what is going on actually from, no, there's another video. Yes. <laughs> this score is actually from Podgorica, uh, and uh, this score is a woman in a home. But they are uh, cultivating all the partisan songs still. And they are going everywhere in Yugoslavia and making concerts about. <laughs> and this song is of George Balash, which actually is made in 1981, I think. It's one song is talking about uh, protesting of the young generations to be more, more liberal society. <laughs> And he's saying that uh, somebody is doubling that we are on a wrong way because we are listening rock and, uh, and, <laughs> and music, but we know very well what to do to protect, actually. And please count on ours, it's actually the... Okay, let's go to another video because it's too long. <laughs> and this is uh, Titova Užice, actually Užice. Uh, there was Užice, one, of, uh, it was the first, it was the first offensive actually, and the first uh, liberated territory in 1941. It was uh, in uh, the chamber in January 1942. Uh, actually when the, the German was uh, near to Moscow, let's say, and nobody in Europe, uh, the Germans uh, they, they succeeded to make liberal territory and republic. And this was the, the monuments in Titova Užice, actually was removed after the collapse in Yugoslavia. Now he, here is somewhere on the side, but it was, it was in a square And now again we have an initiative of the people that they want to return the monument of Tito in Užice because of this is no one because of that uh, resistance uh, against fascism and uh, so on and so on. So I want to say that politicians making uh, decisions without maybe asking the, the, the people, the world of people when you talk about collective memory. So. Okay, stop the video, we don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes, uh, maybe, maybe less or more. No? <laughs> okay. Oh. Yes. Now we're coming to uh, another person, which is in Serbia. Uh, this is um, 
also at the beginning he was anti-fascist, Draža Mihalovic, in the same time when Tito made the, uh, the rebellion movement, he made the, the rebellions with the former uh, army of, uh, of a king of Yugoslavia and, and so on, and, but unfortunately uh, later he, he went to cooperate with the, with the Germans and uh, he lost the support of Churchill and so on and after the liberation he was uh, actually uh, robbed and, um, and judged as a culprit and was killed in 1946 I think was killed. But now the, the Serbs, especially the nationalists, they wanted to make rehabilitation and they are making the monuments. The, the first, this is in Bosnia actually. Uh, and the second is in uh, Ravnagora, where actually during the Second World War it was his headquarter uh, in Ravnagora. I think here, uh, just, just a little bit, uh, this is the, the moment when the, the court in, uh, in Serbia made decision, yes, you can let, made decision to be rehabilitated, uh, Draža Mihailovic. And uh, in that time were two groups protesting, one this pro Mikhailovich and the second was against Mikhailovich and that they are actually waiting for the decision of the of the judge. Sud je donao jedino moguću odluku. General Draža Mikhailović je rehabilitovan. What does that mean for Serbia? It means that the court is really victorious. Do you have something to change in the society after the court? It's very nice. A lot of it is changed. After the court, the court is the patriot. Yes. I'm waiting for this day. I can't write it. This day is the same as when he came from Kaga. Two of the most important things are this day. When he came from Kaga. He just wrote it. Forward? No, no, forward. Okay. okay, never mind. We don't have the time. Close the video, yes. Okay, in Croatia, actually, again, we have two groups. One are those who are pro-partisans, let's say, and, uh, and one who are pro-Ustasi. This is actually the monument in Jasenovac. I don't know how much you are familiar with the Jasenovac. Actually, they were killed more than, we don't know the exact number, but some uh, sources are saying that uh, more than half a million people were killed during the Second World War by Ustasha and Germans. Uh, somebody is saying less, somebody is saying more, and so on, but uh, it's still, it's a... Uh, it's a big discussion about. And the second photo is all, um, the monument in Austria in Breiburg, actually, where the around 10,000 Ustasha were killed from partisans at the end of the, of the Second World War. And today uh, we, we have um, a big discussion about uh, who will, be. actually this monument is in a private, let's say, proper ship, and it's a discussion who they have uh, to be official or not official state and so on, it's a, it's a huge discussion about that. Srebrenica, uh, actually we heard about that. This is the memorial of Potočari in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I agree, it's not only Srebrenica where it's deserved to have uh, this kind of, uh, of memorial center. Uh, also we have also so many massive graves in, in during the Bosnia and maybe, but, but however this is what's going on uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we, we, the memorial is on this way. Now we go into the new, new period, actually, the, the, the wars of, um, of the 19th and 2000. This is in Kosovo, uh, where the, we are now having the monuments of the Kosovo Liberal Army, Uchak, how they say. This is one, the battle in Kosare and, Bitu, and Botuše, where actually we don't know also the number of how many people died, but it was a front line between um, Albania from other side where the, the soldiers of Uchako war and from other side were the Serbian soldier and uh, uh, there were a lot of different statistics. We still don't have a clear number how many people died, but I think that more than 5,000 people died there. 
this is also interesting what we see in Pristina because of the thanks to the Bill Clinton and the <laughs> independence they in a, in the center of Pristina they made the statue of of Bill Clinton. This is also Uchak in Macedonia uh, because uh, now it is not the same name uh, as uh, yeah, that name is the same, Uchaka, but uh, here is a uh, uh, liberal army for of Kosovo and in Macedonia is liberal army for the, of the nation. And we have these monuments. These are the first monuments made a lot of uh, debates in Macedonia because they are showing the map of the ethnic Albanians or the great Albania we saw and uh, it was a uh, very controversial. Okay, now coming to this uh, identity, let's say, memories. You know, in Macedonia, we have a, a big discussion, a neglecting of uh, identity of the history and so on. And the world is much more knowing about Alexander Great and the Philip uh, and Project Scopy 2014. But the biggest, let's say, project about the identity of Macedonia is in Ohrid, in my city. There we see the church of uh, where actually was the monument, the, the mission of San Clemente. If you come and talk it there, you will see. I think Aniko, you were there. <laughs> it's it's very it's very beautiful. It's a uh, it's um, sorry. Okay, and uh, that that was actually the biggest project in Macedonia after the, the, the liberation, and it was much more for building of the identity of Macedonia and so on. I don't know how we are familiar with San Clemente. Actually, there was created the first. Slavic, Slavic alphabet for the whole Slavic world. Uh, for that reason, this is very important place for the whole Slavic. And uh, now what is very actual with the Bulgarians and uh, why, why is it the veto for Macedonia? I think for Albania also, they're not aware <laughs> why is the veto for the both country. This is the, the person for which actually is a dispute about uh, the identity and the history and so on. So uh, Bulgarians are denying the Macedonian identity. This is a book, uh, Ten Lies About the Macedonism by Bozo Dimitrov, actually was published 20 years ago. And this person, Kilimento, the San Clemente, Godset, Telechev, and Ilin the Uprising are actually the, those historical, let's say, persons and moments which we have a dispute about. Uh, and actually, it, it stopped uh, the integration of the Western Balkan to the European Union because of these four, four, four persons. And I, we made the joint commission only for Samuel yesterday they show in the colleagues from Hungary. Uh, it, it, we did find the solution, but for the other person, no. I know it was too much, but thank you very much. <laughs> No, it was very comprehensive. It was, uh, it was uh, you, you could maybe think about putting together a whole series of volumes about uh, different, even, and they, even we might uh, think about the history of memory of, of all of these um, uh, regions. Uh, so, and I find it really very fascinating. I wonder if there is any kind of questions or comments uh, from the audience. Yes. Thank you very much, Rubin, for your presentation. I'm stopping, so I'm starting from the end. Uh, I really didn't get what was the point of your presentation. What, if you have a conclusion or a message to give, or what is, uh, sorry? In the introduction. Because I didn't get it, I don't know if the others. It was very okay. We have different memories. We have different uh, types of uh, of perceiving of the reality of the history. But I, I I wanted to to know more about that. Thank you. Any? Okay. Actually. Uh, the conclusions for me, you know, maybe it's not for you, the conclusions for me is uh, that identity and collective memory are always going together. And how we are constructing the identity, we are constructing the collective memory. That's it maybe, the, because identity is construction. Identity is not uh, a fact, it's a construction, it's a narrative, it's a subjective perception of, uh, of, uh, of, our, of our surrounding, including the collective memory. So because we need uh, 
uh, to make uh, the future an identity for us and for our community and for our family, we have to construct the history. And actually, for me as anthropologists, each history in the world and the identity of nature and constructions. Like um, Frederick Anderson is saying in uh, his book, Imagine Communities. Can I have a question to, oh, okay. Uh, there we get a question from Huma. Thank you for your presentation. A lot of information and testimonies, especially for our generation that did not live that time. So, and that's a very interesting um, observation and that's exactly why uh, such studies are being done. Yes, Rubin. Uh, to one um, sentence that Churchill said, Winston Churchill, who said that uh, the Balkan is producing much more history than can consume. <laughs> yes, well, uh, mm, well, uh, yes and no. Uh, let's not uh, go into the battle of who is has richer histories and worse memories and who suffered more and who suffered less because that's never the right path to go down on. But uh, it's certainly very interesting. Um, and I was listening to all of your, yes, can I finish? And then I will, I will turn to the question. So I was listening to all of your individual talks and what struck me was that, yes, you all wanted to emphasize memories of suffering, memories of death and mourning. And that's fine, that's a big, huge paradigm of 20th century memory studies to, to uh, study collective and individual forms of memory in order to work through these past traumas, which evidently are not yet, uh, uh, it hasn't arrived at a sort of a, a rest. However, I was wondering if there's any memories that could we could build communities on because uh, memories that are productive, memories that are about civil action. Mem this morning we had the, se uh, the session on activism. Activism also has memories. It, it's, it, it doesn't grow out of thin air and we are just inventing it out of nothing. The, we all build on existing memories of, of certain uh, forms of action or certain um, relationships. And I was really fascinated by Zala's um, formulation of how friendship can be understood in different ways. So I was wondering if there are such memories. Well, I think even if, uh, yes, uh, just one second. Even if uh, these are negative memories or, or painful memories, just purely talking about them and working them out will uh, help us to form um, some kind of collective identity. That's what we experienced in, you know, Kusek, uh, Kusek people carries horrible memories from the Second World War, Holocaust memories, memories from the communist period, and uh, they really uh, these books and the fact that we started to talk ab about them, I mean their uh, 20th century history, help them to work it out, sort of. And it's true for these other cities, and of course this is just one example, but we know many more. So even if these are negative memories, it doesn't mean that they don't contribute to some identity building. Yes, thank you for your um, question. So. Of course, um, the the most intuitive thought about when you when you when we talk about friendship is to say community building, warm, shared narratives, shared thoughts, shared food, you name it, and um, uh, even for activism, I think that activists also kind of always emphasize we are building this community, but it gives us hope, right? We are sensing trauma which we're trying to fix but w why why we are actually fighting is we're fighting for for some hope for a better for some hope for a better future right mm -hmm. um so even if you're gonna be looking at 
Jacques Derrida's famous, like the politics of friendship, he, he will start not with the friendship which has lost his, he will start with friendship which is imperfect, but then he will also emphasize that through history what you're going to have is like pleiades of, of texts on, on the death of the friend, like Cicero's De Amicitia is gonna start, my friend is dead, and now we're gonna commemorate him in the form of a dialogue, right? Which also implies some sharing of thoughts and some sharing of, of, um, of ideas, but it's precisely because the friendship is impossible, imperfect, you name it, it this is precisely what gives you the, the hope or the obligation to, 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 to try. So uh, this is one reason why, why, I mean, I know it's not negative, but th the reason why I tend to also um, emphasize negative um, aspects is because I think that when we talk about friendship, we have the tendency to fall into the trap of being positivistic in the sense of we can save Yugoslavia, we have friendships and we have people who believe in multi-ethnicity and this is the path we should take and let's just do reconciliation, right? And why haven't we figured something like this, or this already before? Um, so this is why it's, it's important to have um, many options in which, you can, in which you can speak about this. But the idea behind it, I hope that people understood, is always positive. Sorry, but I will not continue with such positive, <laughs> positive uh, uh, energy. I think that uh, while I was conducting my fieldwork uh, in Priedor, it was really people do have hope, hope that things will change and they will change for the better. But I think that as long as the crimes committed over the Bosnian uh, Bosniaks and the Croat population in Priedor will, will not be recognized by the authorities, there is no chance for like reconciliate or to really be friends again. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of my interviewees did emphasize the fact Bosnian Serb neighbor helped me. They hid me or my family members during the war and they helped us. But um, now I really noticed this division between people, they live, they co-live in one city, but they are practically divided. And I think this is, especially in the case of Bosnia and, Herzegov and Herzegovina, a big problem. I, would, I want to be positive about it. I want to say that uh, there is hope, there is friendship, of course there is, but still not as much. I still think that the nationalistic pol political parties have way more power than the civic society. There are initi initiatives, I mentioned in the afternoon, um, the initiative that is in Priedor uh, because it concerns me. Uh, but I think that their voice is maybe more heard outside of Bosnia than in Bosnia. And I think this is, uh, yeah, still a problem. Yeah, sorry to end so negative. <laughs> <laughs> People wanted a um, hard question and easy answer, but it's not possible to answer easy about this question. I, I think that, uh, yes, activism is creating collective memory. When we're talking about the Yugoswera, our colleague the novel during the, the, t the Tito's time was um, very old, those uh, voluntary actions of building the infrastructure during the Yugoslavia, even today, um, so we have some some similar, let's say, initiative to making uh, infrastructure on that voluntary basis of the youth, and uh, of course the reminding of a collective memory. From other side, wha wha my experience in the field is actually that for all these challenges and struggles that we had during uh, these 30 years, people always asking uh, solutions by the collective memory, <laughs> by the traditions how they solved uh, something in a similar situation and so on. For that reason, I think that uh, activism and collective memory are always in good relation, positively. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the panel. Uh, um, I really enjoyed it. Uh,
maybe uh, Zala, I really thought your presentation was really fascinating. I enjoyed it and uh, I, I had, a, because I'm really tired for some reason, I had troubles following. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you if you could maybe elaborate a bit more on this like idea of uh, emotions and importance of them for your research. Because I, I also interested into this, uh, my supervisor uh, who, who was working uh, in Hague uh, for a while and also uh, wrote, uh, was doing his PhD during the wars in the Balkans, was writing about the role of dark emotions in breeding uh, the conditions for genocide that happened in Srebrenica. Um, I'm, in, I'm interested in the role of emotions in, in, in relation to the construction of the state itself. Uh, so if you could uh, maybe elaborate on this a bit more. And uh, Petra, I really also thank you for your presentation. Uh, um, maybe if you could uh, reflect uh, upon your own positionality when researching uh, these kind of really atrocious uh, crimes, but that maybe didn't particularly happen in, uh, in your own um, society. This is something that you can debate. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I find it so difficult for me to do this research uh, myself, but why I also understand some people from Priedor who are actually descendants of those people that were in camps are doing PhD on this uh, wartime crimes as a kind of self-liberating uh, process, which I also understand quite a bit. And a second question for you. I, I stayed in Kevljani one summer uh, um, uh, at, at the place of a person who was imprisoned in one of these uh, camps in a high school near this uh, village. And uh, the, the guard at the high school was his ex-teacher. Um, I, but when I was at the Omarska, also at the commemoration, and what I found particularly interesting, that there was no presence of like, uh, let's say, uh, Croat politicians. I would say, even though you mentioned that Croats were also, uh, you know, a, a part of this uh, story, and um, during that day, no Croat, single Croat politician in Bosnia and Herzegovina referred to this event which is like a non-event for crowd politics at the time. So maybe it's a selfish kind of question, but if you could reflect, why do you think that this is the case? And what was your like kind of ethnographic experience of being there uh, for three months with regards to this kind of uh, crowd question of uh, Prieto? Yeah, thank you. Do I have time for another question? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm very interested in this uh, reconciliation process, positively interested, and I started also through some basic research uh, exploring how reconciliation can be possible through cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy, and so on. But um, I think that um, reconciliation process is very complex, like um, involving uh, practices and approaches from transitional justice, international law uh, concepts, and uh, leadership agency will, and so on. But it has also an imperative aspect, which, which is the human aspect. Um, empathy and activism at the gross, uh, gross, uh, grassroots level, but also at a more up, uh, upper level, like civil society, um, uh, youth engagement, and so on. So I think it is very important to keep these uh, communication channels open, uh, also through communities and through uh, societies that actually expect a lot from the uh, political level. So um, what is your, what is your, your uh, uh, opinion on that? So how can we keep these communication channels open and start to build on that something? Thank you. Um, Igor, thank you for your question. Um, I think that although emotions are also, as I said, structured and also restricted and also like um, um, directed and um, um, everything in, in, in that direction, I think that I still primarily to say that in my research, it's primar like my primarily my focus or my intent. It's it's not. So every time when when people are asking me for references, um, I'm always kind of st stuck with, okay, some basic reference that, that I would give people like Barbara Rosenwein. And, and, but, but what I was struck when I was um, um, uh, upgrading my, my knowledge just, just recently was that, like for example, in 2002, there was a book out by Franke Wilmer on, 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 on the disintegration of Yugoslavia. And she would go into this direction, emotions, let's, let's take Melanie Klein and the self and the other, and let's build a moral community, which of course 
completely like put my jaw down that this was actually the fault that she was going and it hasn't been continued since so basically 20 years since that book was out but at the same time there was no emotional turn in scholarship back then neither in the IR neither in the in the history um, of emotions or whichever discipline afterwards came to the came to the um, came to the importance of of the concept but otherwise what comes out as a side product um, two, two, two things come to, to mind and one is um, I think fear was instrumental for people to start going into the direction of like, togetherness and then the, the feeling of unitedness in what we're doing. Of course, the, the, peop the, the fear coming from the threats, coming from the, 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 the Serbian politicians in like um, creating it, um, creating it as a mecha uh, mechanism of har harassments that were repre representatives of um, uh, uh, other 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 groups in in the former Yugoslavia, but then of course n the myth. Uh, the, then of course that the, as said, this is what we all feel, and of course because people are um, social social beings, I think can be. Uh, um, I think that uh, being connected in a thought, being solidary in um, in a group, moving towards a goal, uh, despite of the the possibility that maybe our unitedness wasn't as united as we then mythicized it afterwards, right? I think that this is a very strong um, trigger. So um, firstly, the, the fear that something's going to happen and then now we feel connected and this is why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your questions. Uh, actually, yeah, just to give you a funny story, for my PhD I was researching uh, patriotic songs of Bosnian and Herzegovinian army. So this positioned me in Republika Srpska to be on the side of the enemy. No, and I attended an event uh, celebrating the soldiers of uh, Republika Srpska army. And it was my fear, oh my God, what if someone finds out what my PhD topic was about? It was just my really fear. Um, and I position myself in this, oh my God, I am on the uh, enemy's territory researching, not the enemy, but their stories. Uh, but as coming from Slovenia, is really helpful being a Slovenian during research in Bosnia, because of course, uh, I was not involved, I mean, no, I was not personally involved in the conflict. Uh, Slovenians had always been uh, well perceived among Bosnians. Uh, I did had some difficulties uh, approaching to Bosnian Serbs asking about mass graves because it was always uh, the non-existence of them, that nobody knew anything about that. And it was the first time that I actually heard from people telling me the genocide didn't happen. And this was like for me personally and for me as a scholar, a really difficult time. Uh, first, from this personal perspective, how I deal with it as a person and how I deal with this as a scholar. Because, of course, in the project I'm interested in the st all stories of individuals, not just about one particular ethnic group. And uh, referring or to, to answer the, the Omarska situation, I think that um, as far as I know, Omarsk, the commemoration of the Omarska is really uh, non-nationalistic, they really like try to not ignore, but they will, the organizers really say, no, we don't want any uh, political representatives or religious representatives uh, being involved because this is not a political rally. This is about the victims who died there, who suffered there. And I think that in general in Bosnia, although its official name is Bosnia and Herzegovina, Herzegovina is always kind of left out. The absence of Croats is always except in Herzegovina. And I think in the Republika Srpska, this is also the problem uh, that there are no Bosnian uh, Croats left in, in, uh, in, the, in the area. Uh, and yeah, I think that the main message of uh, both all the commemorations is acknowledge the victims and to continue with the reconciliation, I assume that was a question also for me. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that as long as the political parties or the Bosnian Serbs do not recognize the crimes they've committed and say, we did it, we are sorry, let's move on, the reconciliation is not possible. I'm definitely not an expert on this, uh, on this topic, but like, from my point of view, I think this acknowledgement has to happen first. Uh, and as you said, uh, the then is always status quo that will be that will be in Bosnia, and that's why I'm not optimistic about the the situation in the country, and that's why I understand all of my friends and colleagues who are leaving the country. Just to have a qu quick comment on what if it never happens. That the other day I was um, reading a paper by international relations scholar who does friendship theory, and and he did a co-paper about. Um, Israeli-German friendship, and he makes a very, it looks very simple and very primitive like formulation of what is needed. And what is needed is a shared reading of history. Very simple, isn't it, right? So we should agree on this, and, and good luck to us, not to, not, not to end on a too, too positive note. And continue with brotherhood and unity, right? <laughs> with brotherhood and unity. Yes. Sean. Sean. I've got to be careful in terms of the way that I express this because I think one of the most important points that all of you have made in different ways, but Ruben made expressly, is the fact that identity is a function of collective memory. That's how people define themselves. That is the construct of nationhood. It's the construct of many different identities. Groups of, in religious orders, define themselves in particular way. It's, it's how we do it. That is the natural condition. Now, when there has been catastrophe, and let's be perfectly blunt, Europe has 2,000 years of waves of catastrophe in different parts of the Europe. If you have any inclination, you can find four or five digital mobile maps on the web showing how the borders of communities and societies have changed over extended periods of time. If you look at the modern world, Israel-Palestine is an archetypal example, but it extends far more widely than that in terms of Sunni-Shia conflicts across the whole of the Middle East, Myanmar in recent times. Uh, just to give you one sort of dimension, two and a half million people have died in the last 20 years in Africa. Two and a half million people in genocide. They're not characterized as genocides, they're just large-scale catastrophic wars associated with famine and all sorts of other extraordinary things. This is what happens in the world. Then you've got to try and do something about it. It's very difficult. I've been involved in Middle Eastern peacemaking efforts since the 1990s. I wrote the National Peace Accord in South Africa. We put together the Peace and Reconstruction Foundation. Prior to that, I'd done the independence of Namibia. I miscalculated and completely messed up the transition in Angola. And nearly a million people died in Angola between 1992 when the elections were held and 2002 when the war finally came to an end. Along the way, between 1997 and roughly the present, approximately six to 700,000 people have died in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and you're all familiar with what happened in Rwanda in the early 1990s. So this stuff happens. What you do about it matters. That's, that's the fundamental issue. One can say collective memory defines identity. Yes, it does, fundamentally. And unless you make an extraordinary effort to overcome that, unless you engage actively in attempts at creating reciprocal understanding of the circumstances that gave rise to it, and that doesn't involve equality of blame or equality of action, 
Usually there's a significant imbalance in these things. But you've got to come to grips with it, because if you don't come to grips with it, if that isn't done collectively, there is no possibility of moving forward. What is happening in Gaza now is because we failed in the aftermath of the Camp David Accords, because Clinton was distracted by other things at the time to resolve issues. Ironically, we didn't need to fail. We happened to do some track two work at that point in time, and in terms of a set of originally 12, later distilled to 10 principles in terms of a two-state solution, we got 72.6% approval in the Palestinian areas in a referendum and 69.4% approval in the Israeli areas. It's not that it's impossible to find solutions, it's that we don't put the effort into making it happen. Now the South African experience was a curious one because there was a mechanism that was put in place. It was called the Truth and Reconstruct Commission. The logic was that if you put in a structured format people who were accused by one side or the other, and there were seven or eight different sides, but if you put those people in front of a commission that had been established in the aftermath of the elections in 1994, you could get amnesty in respect of what, you'd done, what you had done if you told the truth. And you were subject to cross-examination and the, victim, the families of the victims had the opportunity of appointing legal representatives paid for by the state for that particular purpose. I'm not telling you the truth and reconstruction uh, commissions are the solution in this. I am just saying that when we invest in trying to address these issues, when we, ad when we invest in trying to create some sort of collective understanding of what happened, then it ceases to be quite as divisive as it was before. It never goes away. It's not going to disappear. People still remember, families still celebrate, those monuments that you were showing will always be there. Some will be unifying, Tito, others will be divisive. But you can bridge it, but it requires an extraordinary degree of effort. It doesn't happen naturally. Yes, would you like to comment? Yes, I totally agree. I also uh, one comment to you and maybe to, to Elira's. Uh, even the identity, we have to also put the ideology. Because uh, all these uh, events and victims are because of the ideology. Maybe ethnicity and identity is uh, on the service of the ideology, like communism, fascism, and so on. But they, they, they use the ethnicity as a catalysator for making this uh, massive. And about the, the Liras, uh, I think that um, we heard in many times from the older people in Bosnia, in Croatia, in Serbia, in Macedonia, and so on. Uh, and they are using very, we anthropologists were always asking smart words, wise words from the tradition. And they are saying uh, one word that. Uh, we we may forgive, but it's not allowed to to forget, <laughs> because if we forget, it will be again repeated. Okay, we will forgive what has happened. I, I, I'm a, a person who is not uh, blind to one nation and to make a collective blame to one community, because for the guilty, what has happened for me is always individual criminal. It's not a collective criminal. Uh, individuals make this. Uh, Terrible things. Yes, we can forgive, but not to to forget. <laughs> to forget it is not possible. Yeah. Nobody yeah, they are mentioning. They are mentioning. Yeah. What you? Well, uh, there's some um, discussions uh, going on about uh, whether or not Bulgaria will again veto uh, the accession of Macedonia into the EU. 
And then it seems that V2 application might be changed if EU wants it. Comments? Yeah, actually, it's changed because the these so-called identity issues are not anymore in the European uh, negotiation framework. Uh, all this, what Bulgaria has in regarding the identity, it's only uh, now it's only one condition just to put Bulgaria in a in a constitution that will be, of course, uh, uh, made. I think it's not big uh, issue for Macedonia, but uh, of course now this the right wing party or Maradopomane probably they want to make something. Uh, to win some points political, I think I think that uh, uh, until no November, I hope they will they will solve the problem with Bulgaria about putting the Bulgarians in a preamble constitution. But the, the identity issues, I think that this uh, uh, commission, what yesterday com Catherine also spoke, uh, joint commission, historical commission, uh, they, they, they between Bulgaria and Macedonia, they still have to work but with no time limit, because I think that also we have uh, other issues in the Europe between France and Germany, for example, and Polish and Germany, that they didn't have time limit how to solve. But one is what the Bulgarian asking that we must solve the, the work of this commission and the history narrative of these persons for until the negotiation will end. I think it's not possible for five or seven years to finish it. But however, it's good to discuss. Yeah. Thanks very much. A uh, very interesting panel, I have to say. It was really, uh, really good. I have now a question for the Hungarian case, because I was kind of thinking about uh, your presentation then. I'm, I'm an Austrian living in Hungary for a while. And uh, before I arrived to Hungary, I always had the impression that, you know, the regime change was just good. You know, it was only perceived positive especially from the countries in the West, you could say. That was something, you know, everyone should be grateful and, and you know, only good things came out of it. But I think what you mentioned today is there were a lot of, and I mean, while I was talking now to my uh, colleagues as well, they started to talk about the impact it had because there were, you know, parents lo lost their jobs. It was a, a very fast uh, break in, in, in security situations and in, in life stories. So there was a lot of happening which had a lot of impact on, on uh, you know, people in my, my age now. So, and it's still there and that's kind of fascinating. And I, I wonder, and I think you indicated it somehow, that no one really addressed maybe this traumatic changes, you know, of, of people, you know, how they dealt with the end of communism uh, and and what kind of, I mean, I can see now in Hungary, I think what's important for Hungarian is financial and economic security and that's the way they vote, as yes, they vote, because if that's promised, that uh, that's going to stick with it. So. Um, I don't know, maybe can you just elaborate a bit more on, on, on that kind of notion that maybe it was not addressed enough. Um, thanks. Thank you very much. Just don't forget the question, please. No, I don't forget the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I also would like uh, to move along the line that Chan suggested that uh, things can be done. So obviously we keep focusing on terrible uh, things that happened. But we should also keep, try to keep in mind things that did not happen because there are mechanisms that are trying to prevent them. Let me give you uh, an example. Uh, there is an international organization, European Network of Remembrance and Solidarity. It was uh, created uh, about 15, 16 years ago. Originally, it was an initiative coming from Germany and Poland. Uh, the problem was that after 10 years of endless discussions, a Holocaust memorial was set up in Berlin. But there was an opposition to that, plus it got into some kind of a party debate because the Social Democrats were for the Holocaust Memorial, and the Christian Democrats, Christian thought said that something has to be done about the Germans uh, who were uh, forced uh, to leave their homes. So that is also a great number of people. And there should be then other monument set up. Now, this could have led to a very bad internal uh, 
confrontation also within Germany, both along party lines and also along social lines. But the idea was to set up some kind of an international organization. Instead of a new monument, let us have an organization which is trying to work not in the short run, but in the very long run along this. I, I do not very much like the word reconciliation, but trying to develop mutual empathies. And this is what is happening, that it has been now going on for about 15 years, it is supported mainly by the German and Polish governments. Now, if you think of uh, the Polish-German relationship, so terribly conflict-loaded, terribly conflict-loaded, but still, with the help of this organization and a great number of other measures, this is not now taking us to day-to-day -day conflict. And uh, it is very important that this international organization that I mentioned is focusing on young people. So secondary school teachers and college students. For example, they are bringing them together at disputed territories like Schleswig-Holstein or Elsa-Lorraine or the uh, Vojvodina, uh, all kinds of places where they are bringing students from both sides and then with the, under the guidance of experts they are having discussion. This is going on in the long run, or um, other organizations, so it was the project on ethnic relations, and a, a US-based uh, uh, NGO, I would say. And uh, in, during the early 90s, they substantially contributed to negotiations between the Romanian government and the Hungarian minority organization, the Slovak government and Hungarian minority organization, etc., etc. If we don't know what was avoided, but maybe with the help of this organization, some terrible confrontation could have been avoided. So we have to keep on moving and, uh, and, and, and trying to focus on various options that open up along this line. Sorry. No. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to add that all this happened after Germany admitted its guilt after the Second World War. So we have to keep in mind this element. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So just briefly, because I think we are getting pretty much to the end of the session. So you are absolutely right, and I think it's very important to talk about that, and that's what I try to describe, I think, when I perhaps use the word competing memories. Because um, it's, um, yes, of course, after the transition, uh, uh, you know, the, the domination, dominating narrative was that, yes, uh, now it's a free word and uh, we are closer to the West and uh, we got rid of the t totalitarian regime and, you know, it was like a very optimistic um, feeling on behalf of many Hungarians that uh, we are going to have a better future. And as time passed, of course, we faced the problems, the economic problems, also the social problems. Uh, well, it's, it's a long story. But um, the, the only thing I can, I think, what can be a remedy to these kind of, you know, pros and contras is that we accept, we have to accept the fact that, yes, there are parallel narratives and we have to give a uh, word to all of them. Uh, it's just, I just showed uh, uh, Bella that because, uh, you know, I just used one example here. It's not just a minor example. Uh, perhaps, I don't know how many of you are, of course, Hungarians are familiar with the online journal 24.com. Uh, the, the, sorry, 24.hu. Uh, it's an oppositional, Hungarian oppositional uh, online journal. And the leading article now is about the guy I talked about, Janos Pop, and his victim, Arpad Brusnyai, who was the positive hero and the bad guy and the good guy. And they tell the story. But, of course, I didn't mention because there was no time in 10 minutes. I just talked to a colleague a week ago. I've been working on this case now for a year. And this colleague of mine, who is an elderly uh, uh, historian, she is a, a, a very knowledgeable person, she just told me that, be careful. There is a minor detail nobody really uh, talks about. I never heard this. I went to West Prim and talked to West Prim colleagues a hundred times, that the good guy removed the Jew from 
you know, the leaders of the, of the revolution, they don't talk about it because they have the hero, the positive hero, and there is the bad guy, the party leader. But unfortunately, unfortunately, there was also a Jewish guy. So now, of course, I have to look it up and have to figure out what actually happened, which is never possible to figure that. So the reason why I'm telling you that, because my only, as a historian, I can only see the possibility that, yes, uh, we have to accept that and we have to try to find common stories, but as in the case of uh, marriage, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes people, th th there is just no negotiation. Hopefully, uh, more and more groups can find common narratives, but it might happen that people just don't because because they can't and as a historian that's what I can see that sometimes it happens so that's my comment small thing to add to, to Monica's point yes things are possible and they can be done with interest and with money but firstly it's interest right um, but then also it's important to it's important to acknowledge that when one door closes a window opens so, so if you can't rebuild something, or if you just don't want to, or if it's just like the end of the road and we have nothing to discuss because we just like change this much, then I'm sure that it's just like a natural way to, 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 to turn into another direction, find new alliances, find new possibilities to work. So it's ne definitely, I mean, it can be the end of the, um, the end of the, I don't know, the end of the street, but it's never the end of the road. Do we have anything left in ourselves? Anything? If if you don't, because you are tired and we all want to just go and get some ice cream and stuff, <laughs> then <laughs> yeah, it's really good. It's really good. You can always uh, contact us or contact the panelists and and uh, start a, an online discussion as well. So yes, of co of course, Rubin. Just uh, for those who are interested, uh, me and Bella actually discussed it in January in Ohrid. We organized an international conference about the identity and collective memory. So all of you who are writing, we will share the call for paper. Yeah. Thank you also uh, to the online audience and see you back here tomorrow at 10.